over the last few uh, months as our family's been experiencing the things we've been experiencing and walking through the things we've been walking through. I've been uh, asking God if there's some changes I need to make in my life. And he's been very faithful to show me as I've reflected on the things that needed to begin to change in my life. And so I've tried to implement those changes without making any big announcements, without making any you know big scene about it. And one of the things that's been fun is that people are starting to notice, especially those people that are closest to me. And so over the last several weeks, last seven weeks specifically probably, uh, at some time or another, at least one of my, all three of my daughters at one time or another have looked at me and said this very thing to me, who are you? Because they've seen me start to do some things. And some of it's just like minor things, you know, some about eating food that I never would have eaten before, going places I never would have gone, you know, just doing things that uh, you know, we're out on the lake this last weekend and with the family, and the question was asked, who wants to go first? I'm like, I'll go first. And they're like, you never volunteer. Who are you? You never go first. You know, you let everybody else go. And so just trying to make some changes, and they're starting to notice. And the question is, who are you? I- I've never seen this kind of, this side of you. Now, we need to be careful because sometimes when people ask us the question, who are you, they see positive things, and sometimes they see really negative things, right? And so I want us to kind of zero in on the positive side. So the first question I have to ask you this morning, very simply, is who are you? Who are you? And hopefully we'll come back and we'll lasso that question at the end of the end of the gathering and maybe it'll start to make sense. So the first question of the day is who are you? The second question of the day that I have for you is what if? What if Creator God desperately desires to be known? What if the God of the universe who spoke everything into existence, what if the God who is good, the God who said, and it was so, and it was good, what if this God wants to know you? What if he wants to know human beings? What if the culminating act of his creation was uh, women and men, and he placed mankind in this place we call the garden? And what if he came down in the cool of the day, and he walked with them, and he talked with them? What if there is a creator God, and he desperately desires to be known? And he lays out for mankind a way to live. And mankind typically says, God, we're not sure you're God. We're not sure you're good. And we know you can't be trusted. So our spiritual parents said no. And they have ate. And we've tasted the consequences of their disobedience ever since. And man has been on a journey away from God. What if creator God is the God who pursues? What if he has never stopped pursuing man because he's got this desperate desire to know you and to care for you? What if this desire is so great that he sent his one and only son to the planet? What if he said, I want you to know me and here's my son. This is how much I love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And what if his son shows up on the planet and begins to say and do some really amazing and kind of outlandish things. He shows up and he says, "Uh, you want to know God? You want to know the way back to God? I'm the way. There's one and only way. Just me. I'm the way. What if he says, hey, you want to know what the father's like? Look at me. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. What if, he, what if he shows up and he says, I love you so much, come to God through me? What if he's willing to die on a cross, be put in a tomb and rise from the dead? So Jesus begins teaching a 17-word sermon. The time has come, the kingdom of God is drawn near. Repent and believe the good news. And he shows up one day and he tells a story about a shepherd who has 100 sheep. And one of them goes and wanders away. And the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes and picks up the one and he puts it on his shoulders and he brings it back and says, there's great rejoicing in heaven. Would you agree with me, please, that that is not a story about animal husbandry? It's a story about how desperately God loves his children. He tells a story about a woman who's, who's lost a coin and she tears her house upside down and she invites people, come help me look for the coin. And she finds it and there's great rejoicing in heaven over this coin that has been found. Would you agree with me? That's not a story that all of us need to be coin collectors. It's a story about how desperately God will go on a search for you when you run and are lost far away from him. And then he tells a story about a son who goes to his dad and says, dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my share of the inheritance now. And the dad gives it to him and the son goes off and he squanders it in wild living and he comes back and he's walking home. He's like, Man, my, dad's, my dad's slaves live better than I do. If I could just ask dad, if I could, if I could be one of his hired hands. And he comes walking down the lane and the dad sees him coming. And the dad runs out of the house, out of the gate, grabs his son on the road, embraces him, hugs him and screams at the top of his lungs, go kill the fatted calf. Put a robe on his back and a ring on his finger. The son of mine who was dead is now alive. The son who was lost is now found. Would you see that there is a God who desperately desires to be known and in a relationship with you? What if, what if 
What Jesus said is he's about ready to ascend into heaven. He rises from the dead. He appears over the earth over 40 days and he's about ready to ascend into heaven and he gathers his followers on a hill and pick whichever one of the great commissions of the commission stories that you want. This is what he says to those gathered on the hill. He says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. He says, go, make disciples, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. Before he ascends into heaven, what if he said, for this message and this mission to carry on, it's up to you human beings. If people want to know what God's like now, they can't look at Jesus, but they can look at you. What if the call in our life is to be an accurate reflection of who God is? We talk about being God reflectors around here. What if? What if it's up to you and me to carry the story, the message, and the reputation of Jesus forward? Are you ready to live like that? Are you ready to accept that call on your life? What if? We talk about it this way around here. We talk about living like priests and prophets. So I've got a couple of more questions for you. Are you ready to live like a priest? The scripture, this ancient text, tells us that God is looking and been trying to build a kingdom of priests. In the world Jesus lived in as you traveled country to country, if you wanted to know what the God of the region was like, you looked at the priests. And what we learn from that is if people want to know what our God is like, they should look no further than us. Are you ready to live like a priest? Are you ready to put the divine on display? And when people want to know what your God is like, all they have to do is look at how you live and what you say. Are you ready to live like that? And the second question that goes along with that is, are you ready to live like a prophet? We talk about living like priests and prophets. And prophets aren't just people who predict the future. Prophets are people who see God in the daily, who see the divine in the daily. They say, hey, God's at work here and God's at work here. And God's at work. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. This is what God's up to. And you speak the truth and you speak uh, God's passion and his love into people's life. What if you are responsible to carry the story, the message, and the reputation of Jesus to the rest of the world? Are you ready to live like that? I look through this ancient text and there are uh, just time and time and time again as these letters were written, the, the author of the letter seems to be telling real people in real places at real times who are struggling with living out the truth of Jesus' message, hey, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you live like a priest. This is how you live like a prophet. Check it out here. What I want to do with you today is I want to take you to a portion of scripture, written, a letter written by this guy named Paul to a church in called Colossae. If you travel to the ancient world today and go to Colossae, you'd find nothing. No ruins, no remains, just nothing. This is where we think it was. But Paul writes to real people in a real place at a real time, and he tells them, this is how you live. So what I want to do, I want you to turn to uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. If you brought a Bible, find it in your Bible. If you want to use one of those red pew Bibles, you pick one of those up. The page number is referenced up here. If you don't have a Bible of your very own, when you leave today, if you'd stop by our Connect desk, I would love to give you a copy of God's Word of your very own free of charge so that you can have it and read it. But I just want us to look at these five verses, and I want to divide the teaching up into two parts. If you are ready to live like that, if you're ready to be an accurate reflection of who God is to your world, you have two responsibilities according to this passage of Scripture. And I want you to see them. I'm going to talk to you about the first one, then we're going to celebrate this amazing meal, then we're going to sing some more, then I'm going to come up and talk to you about your second responsibility. But as I read through this, listen, if you're following along, follow along, but listen for a recurring word. See if you hear one word that occurs uh, two, three, maybe four times. Paul, to the church at Colossae, says this. If you want to live as an accurate reflection of God in your world, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Did you hear a word that recurred two or three times? Anybody? I heard it. Pray. 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 If you want to be a God reflector, if you're ready to live like a priest and prophet, your first responsibility is to pray for the preacher. Pray for the preacher. Now, the preacher is the one who stands up and proclaims the truth about who Jesus is. The preacher is the one who stands up, hopefully with boldness and conviction and courage, and says, uh, echoes the things of Jesus. The time, has come, uh, the, the time has come, the kingdom of God has drawn near, repent and believe the good news. Jesus is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The preacher is the one who stands up and, and preaches with creativity. But here's what we need to do. We need to redefine preacher. 
You see, for most of you in the room, when I say pray for the preacher, you think about people like me who stand up on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock or Sunday morning at 11 o'clock or Sunday night at 7 o'clock or other times through the week. People who do this for a profession. And, and trust me, I want you to pray for me. Nothing would make me happier than if you would, some of you would come at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights for our time of prayer and that I would be one of the items on your prayer list. That you would pray for me, that God would give me courage and conviction and, and a word to say. I, I, I treasure your prayers. But I'm not talking about praying for me. I want you to pray for me. But I'm talking about praying for the preacher. We need to redefine preacher. And every one of you in this room that claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ, like it or not, you are a preacher. I'm talking to you this morning about praying for the preacher. I'm talking to you about praying for the mom. Praying for the mom who has a heartbeat for other moms who are having uh, just difficulty raising their toddlers and trying to figure out how do we do this in a God-honoring way. And she puts together a life group. She puts together a Bible study and pulls a whole bunch of moms together and, and goes to the Word of God. She's a preacher. We need to pray for that mom. I'm, I'm talking to you uh, about the couple who wants to impact their neighborhood, who says, I look at my neighbors and I don't think any of them want to have anything to do with God. I've got to figure out a way to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ. We need to pray for that preacher. I'm talking to you about the woman in her office who wants to reach her, her co-workers. I push pause and say, please, not on company time. Honor God with your time. Honor your employer. Put in a full day's work. It's not the place on company time to be evangelizing. I hit pause again and keep going. But you find a way through the evening. You find a way uh, to get around those people that you have influence at your workplace. And you want to tell them the truth about Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm talking to you, the guy who's playing recreational softball with a bunch of guys who don't care a hoot about who God is. And you want to tell them the truth. I'm talking to you, those who are coaching your sons and your daughters. And you have a sphere of influence with other families. And you need to be figuring out ways to tell them the truth about who Jesus Christ is. Those are the preachers I'm talking about. Every one of you in the room who bears the name of Jesus Christ, who claims to be his follower, like it or not, you are a preacher. There's an old saying that says, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. We like to focus on the when necessary, use words as if it were never necessary. My friends, sometimes it's necessary to use words. And you need to be prepared. I'm talking to you. You're going to come forward, I hope. You don't need to be a member of this church, but you're going to come forward and take this bread and dip it in this cup. You know what the scriptures say, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you preach Christ's death until he comes. And actually, the word that's used there is proclaim, but it's the Greek word that we would translate preach. And so you're going to come forward today, and you're going to preach. And by taking this bread and dipping it in this cup, you say, I, I'm a preacher. And our first responsibility if we're going to live like priests and prophets is to pray for all the preachers. So when you come forward today, I want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for the preacher in front of you. I want you to pray for the preacher behind you. I want you to pray. We need to pray for the preachers. Paul gets real specific and says there are two, two very specific ways we pray for the preacher. He says, first of all, pray that God would open up a door for us to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in change. First of all, he says pray for an open door. Pray for an open door. And so, uh, most of the time, when we think about God opening a door, who do we think is supposed to walk through it? Us, right? God opens a door, I'm supposed to walk through it. Check this out. I think we need to look at it differently. When Paul was in jail in Philippi, he was with Silas, and they were singing and they were praising God, and at midnight the earth shook and the cell, the, the, the cell doors flew open, Paul stayed put, and a Philippian jailer came running through the door. When God opens doors, my friends, people will come running and asking you, what do you believe about Jesus? I think we need to pray for God to open the doors. And I want you to begin to come when you pray and take the Lord's Supper today and you pray for the preacher. I want you to pray specifically for the doors you're asking God to open. God, I'm asking you to open a door into the life of my family. God, I'm asking you to open a door into the life of my workplace. I'm asking you to open a door into the life of my spouse. I'm asking you to open a door into my school. I'm asking you, God, open this door. And if God will open the door, people will come flooding through it. But God doesn't just open doors for individuals. God opens doors for regions. One of the things I'm begging you today, one of the reasons I drove 650 miles yesterday to be here to teach today was to say this to you. I am begging you to begin to pray with me that God would open a door into Miamisburg, that spiritual things would begin to happen that are inexplicable unless God is involved. I'm asking you to begin to pray with me that the entire city of Miamisburg would meet Jesus Christ and fall in love with him. That they would know that there's a God who loves them, that is in pursuit of them. 
If you spend any time going to city council meetings or watching city council meetings on the, on the uh, public access station, at the end of every city council meeting, Mayor Church always says the same thing. You know what it says? Great things are happening in Miamisburg. And I love that. He's so excited about our city. But you know what we need to be start praying? That supernatural things would start to happen in Miamisburg. That God would raise up people who are praying and that God would, would, would just have people fall in love with him. God changes regions. God open a door into our city. We're gathering every Sunday night at 6 o'clock to pray that very exact prayer. God, open our city. And here's the deal. I want to go on record right now as saying, when God opens the spiritual door to the city, I don't care if one person walks through these doors. If God opens the spiritual doors to this city, I would just as soon every other church in this town that proclaims Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and life gets filled to overflowing and let us get the leftovers. It's not about us getting bigger. It's about Jesus Christ making a difference in people's lives. Pray that God would open to us a door. I'm going to ask you very specifically today, if you can come at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights, come and pray with me for that prayer. If you're not able to come at 6 o'clock, I'm asking you to fill out one of those connect cards that just says, Tim, I'm praying with you that God would open the spiritual door of Miamisburg, that this entire city would be one for Jesus Christ. Are you ready to pray that audacious prayer with me? That's what we need to be praying, my friends, that God would open the door to this city. Pray that God would open the door for us to proclaim the mystery of the, of the gospel for which I am also in change. Secondly, he says, um, pray that I may make it plain as I should. I read that and chuckle. This is Paul, for goodness sake. This is a guy that's traveled on three missionary journeys around the world. This is the guy that speaks and people are converted. This is the guy that seems to know exactly what to say to every person. Why would this guy say, pray that I make it plain? Here's what I think is going on. Let me, let me go at this a different way. Nobody in the first gathering wanted to admit this. But rumor has it that there's a movie coming out this week. Anybody in the room already have your tickets for the midnight showing? Come on, at least in the room twice. There has to be at least one Harry Potter fan. Harry Potter, the, the, the last movie's coming out this week. I told him in the first get so this illustration didn't work in the first, won't work now because you all don't care about Harry Potter, but it's the only illustration I came up with, so you're going to get stuck with it, all right? So here we go. But there's this Harry Potter movie coming out this week. It's the last movie of the last book, and so somebody comes up to me and says, hey, Tim, can you tell me about the, the Harry Potter movie, the book that's coming out? Sure, I can tell you about the Harry Potter movie that's coming out. So cool. Let me, let me tell you about Harry Potter. When he, was a, when he was a kid, his parents died, and he went to, to be raised by relatives, and he had this enemy that came and, and kind of attacked him and tried to kill him, and, and I think his name was Zorro, and he put a like, on his forehead. And so Harry's lived his life with a Z on his forehead, and, and he finally got, got sent. He's got these special wizard powers, so he got sent to this wizard school called Hoglands, and he went to Hoglands, and he, he, he was there, and he, he found two friends. And his best friend's name was Rob, and they have this friend that's a, that's a girl, and her name's Henry, and it's kind of this really weird kind of relation, weird name for a girl, but they, they do all these things that they're not supposed to do around, around Hoglands, and they, they, they find their way, and they start making, making inroads, and they start learning certain things. And one of the things that they're going to do in this movie is they play, play wizard's chess. And wizard's chess is like lifelike, uh, uh, bigger than life pieces, and you've got, you're actually on the back of a horse, you know, that you're, that you're knight, and you're going to capture a pawn, and you take the sword out, and the knight just kills, the, kills the, the pawn on the spot, and the pawn disappears. And then Harry also plays another game, I think it's called, it's called cribbage, and, and, and cribbage, Harry's a, Harry's a setter, and he's just amazing on his broom as he flies around. And this story, man, I can tell you all about this story. This story is the typical, stereotypical story of good versus evil, and good wins. It's all you need to know. You don't need to go see the movie now. And some of you are about ready to jump out of your seats and slap me, aren't you? Right? I messed the story up, right? Because when Harry was a little kid, his enemy wasn't Zorro. His enemy was, it's okay to say it in church, Voldemort. And he doesn't have a Z on his forehead. He has a lightning bolt. And he didn't go to a wizard school called Hoglands. It's called Hogwarts. And uh, his best friend's not Rob. It's and the girl's name's not Henry, it's Hermione. And Wizard's Chess isn't this movie. It was like three movies or four movies ago, right? And he, he doesn't play cribbage, he plays... And he's not a setter, he's a seeker. And some of you are about ready to jump out of your seats and slap me. Say, Tim, don't butcher the story. And I wonder if that's not what Paul's saying. Isn't that exactly what so many of us do with the gospel? We butcher it. 
Oh, we think we know it in summary fashion. Jesus was born, he, he lived, he died, he rose from the dead, and that's all you need to know. No. The story doesn't start with Jesus' birth. The story starts way back in the beginning of a God who desperately wants to be in relationship with human beings and people who ran far from God. And Jesus comes onto the scene and he's born and he lives a life and he preaches a 17-word sermon and he calls followers. All oh, his followers aren't really important. I think they're 13, 14, 12 of them. I don't even know their names. And we butcher the story. And I just wonder if that's not what Paul's saying. Pray for me. When God opens a door and people come flooding through it, I don't want to mess this thing up. I want to know the story from beginning to end, and I want to speak it plainly, and I want to speak it accurately, and I want to speak it correctly. And when it comes time to pray for the preacher, when it comes time to pray for you as you're getting ready to come and take this bread and dip it in the cup, I'm praying for you. Team, if you want to go ahead and come on up. Our responsibility, if we want to be accurate God reflectors, is to pray for the preacher. And if you come and take this bread and dip it in this cup, by doing that, you admit you are a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be praying for you, but I don't want to just pray for you. I want you to pray for each other. I want you to come and I want you to pray, God, open a door for the mystery of the gospel in my family. God, open a door for the mystery of the gospel in my city. God, open a door for the mystery of the gospel in my company. And God, when you open that door, don't let me blow it. Don't let me blow it. Help me to speak it plainly. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, I don't want this meal to be mysterious to you. This meal is the best two-act drama of the summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of God giving his one and only son to come in human form. And the bread reminds us that he came in the form of a human being and he lived a sinless life of perfection, perfection because God was in pursuit of us. And the only way that we were going to find our way back for God was to God to come in the flesh and to give his life for us. And this bread reminds us that Jesus came, God, fully God, fully man, and lived a life and died a death. And the scripture says often as you eat this bread, you proclaim his death. And this cup filled with juice is a reminder of the death he died. A death on a cross. Really God, really dead. Really man, really dead. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And maybe you're in the room today and you came here just hoping somebody would tell you there was a God who loves you and is in pursuit of you who has your best interest in mind and who wants only to have a relationship with you. It comes through faith and trust in Jesus. The scriptures say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. My friend, if you're in the room, if you're listening on the web today, I just want to tell you, say yes to Jesus. But if you've said yes to Jesus and you come and you take this meal, you take the bread and you dip it in the cup, you simply say, I'm a preacher of the gospel. And God, I'm praying that you'd open a door. And God, I'm praying that you'd help me not to blow it. Almighty God, as my brothers and sisters come to take this table, to take this meal at this table, may they be reminded, may they be reminded that they are the preachers. And God, I pray in their families, in their workplaces, in their neighborhoods, in their cities, that you would open a door for the mystery of the gospel. And God, when you open that door wide and people come flooding through it and want to know about Jesus, help us not to blow it. May we know the story. May it be such a part of our life that we speak it with conviction and clarity. Father, I pray for all the preachers in the room today. Open the door. Help them speak with clarity. And so if you're ready to live like a priest, you're ready to live like a prophet, your first responsibility is to pray for the preacher. And so I hope you prayed for yourself. I hope you prayed for the person in front of you, the person behind you. If you haven't prayed for a preacher that's in this room yet, I just look to the person on your left, look to the person on your right, and pray that God would open a door and pray that God would help them make it plain, this beautiful mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you want to live like a priest and you want to live like a prophet, I want to show you something from this text that I think is just, just amazing. Maybe one of the ways that God opens some doors for people to come flooding through. Uh, uh, responsibility number one, pray for the preacher. Responsibility number two, be wise. Be wise. Look what the scripture says. It said, be wise 
in the way you act towards outsiders, people who aren't part of the faith. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you might know how to answer everyone. And so there's this understanding that we need to live, I'm going to use the word uncommon. We need to live an uncommon life. We need to live an uncommon life. And so in these couple of verses, I want you to see that there's uh, uncommon goodness, there's uncommon speech, and there's an uncommon response. Uncommon goodness, uncommon speech, and an uncommon response. The first, let's look at this uncommon life that's filled with uncommon goodness. Make the most of every opportunity. Uncommon goodness. I'm not talking to you about common goodness. There's common goodness. Opening the door for the mother of five toddlers is just fighting to get in the mall. Right? Common goodness. Uh, letting somebody else have your parking space. Common goodness. Let somebody else go in front of you in the, in the 10 items or less checkout line even though they have 11 items. Common goodness. Showing up to help clean up after a tornado. Common goodness. I'm talking to you about uncommon goodness. Make the most of every opportunity. I'm talking to you about the kind of uncommon goodness that Jesus talked about that none of us like. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who calm you, cause you harm. Uncommon, like Tim, nobody lives that way. Right, uncommon goodness, right? I want you to, to think about this. I just want to think, these next four things I want to share with you, some of the things God's just been teaching me over the last six, seven weeks, and I just need to confess to you that I'm a glass, glass half empty kind of guy. Uh, life's just glasses half empty. You know, I, I have a tendency to see the negative just about in everything. And one of the things I've been asking over the last eight, nine weeks is for God to just change. I don't want to live life that way anymore. I don't want to see everything. So I want to share with you four things about how to make the most of every opportunity. Four things that I'm really trying to do right now to make the most of every opportunity that God puts in front of me. The first two, really the same way, uh, two different ways of saying the same thing. The, the first thing I'm having to see if I want to make the most of every opportunity is to understand that God has a purpose for every person in every place. God has a purpose for every person in every place. Now, I don't know about you, but there are in my life some people that, like, rub me the wrong way. I have some friends that call them heavenly sandpaper. You have anybody like that in your life, right? They just rub you. And I would just rather not do anything. I'd just like to ignore them, pray they go away, wish they'd be out of my life. But God has a purpose for every person in every place. And every opportunity, every moment, every situation that I encounter, I'm trying the best to look and say, okay, God, you have a purpose for me in this place, and you have a purpose for that person right there, even if they're rubbing me the wrong way. The, the second thing that says this again is what I need to learn to do is I need to learn to look for the best in every place and watch for the best in every person. When my dad taught me how to do anything athletically, one of the things that he was a stickler for was that everything be done with proper form. And so when I learned to shoot a basketball, I couldn't shoot it from the hip. I had to learn the proper form. And when he taught me how to shoot free throws, I had to shoot it with the proper form. And never once, and any time can I remember, did he ever scold me for doing it wrong. He always praised me for doing it right. When I did it right, that's how you're supposed to, yes, just like that, yes, just like that. You see, I have the tendency to, to, to see people and catch them doing the wrong things and maybe take a little bit of pleasure in that if they're one of those heavenly sandpaper people. What I need to do is I need to look for them doing something right and praise them for when they do something right. I need to look for the best in every place and watch for the best in every person. The third thing that I need to do if I want to make the most of every opportunity, oh, let me, let me go back. Just, you know, the old story about looking for the best in every place and watching for the best in every place. The old story is told about the man who commutes every day to New York City and he's a businessman so he's always dressed in suit and tie and it's winter and he, he didn't have a coat on that day but the, 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 the subway kind of comes to a screeching stop and uh, he kind of lurches forward and as he lurches forward, a man kind of shabbily dressed with this old scruffy coat on bounces into the back of him. And the guy looks at him, and the businessman feels for his wallet in his back pocket, and it's not there. So the, the shabbily dressed man gets around the side of him and heads for the door to get off the subway. And the businessman reaches and grabs his coat. And the man speeds out of the subway train. The man passed down the coat, and his wallet's not there. So he gets to the next stop. He, he just knows his wallet's been stolen. And he comes out. He's walking up the stairs looking for a police officer when all of a sudden his cell phone rings. Is his wife on the other end, honey, I didn't want you to worry. You left your wallet on the dresser. But his tendency was to think this guy just picked his pocket, 
Do you have a tendency to look for the best in other people and look for the best in every situation? I, I don't. The third thing that I want you to, to, that I'm having to learn, whether you do it or not, the third thing that I'm having to learn to do is, is to learn to be a positive reactionary. Most of the time when there's an opportunity and I see the negative and I react to it, my reaction is negative, right? I need to learn to react in the positive. Well, how do you do that? If you're wanting to learn how to react in the positive, here's the deal. Just tell yourself this one thing. God is blessing me right now. In this situation, in this place with this heavenly sand person, sandpaper person, God's blessing me. He's given me life. He's given me breath. He's given me another day. He's given me family. He's given me whatever it is he's given me. God's blessing me right here, right now. I've got to learn to, to react positively. And I'm finding in my life when I understand that God's blessed me right here in this moment, it takes the negative and turns it into a positive. And this next one, you'll uh, forgive me because we got to spend a little bit of time out on the lake. And anytime I'm out on the lake, it makes me think of fishing, something that I love to do. But if I want to, if I want to make the most of every opportunity, I need to get rid of my waste basket and replace it with my tackle box. You see, I see opportunities and I have a tendency to look at them as negative and I immediately think it's wasted time. God, it's a waste of time to be in this place. It's a waste of time to be with this person. I'm not making any progress. They're, they're not so, showing any movement. God, this is just a waste of my time. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my time. Why'd you put me here? Why'd you put me with this person? But you see, what I remember this week when I was out on the lake, I have never once thought that fishing was a waste of time. Even if I wasn't catching anything. Just to have my line in the water was great. But if I had my line in the water and wasn't catching anything, I didn't say, oh, this is a waste. What did I do? I went to my tackle box. I tried to find a new lure. tried to find something that would work. tried to make the most of my time. This wasn't working, so I'll try a different approach. And in my own life, when I'm looking at things, I have to get rid of the waste basket and consider things a waste and say, okay, God's given me a set of tools. He's given me a set of skills. I just need to grab a different lure. I just need to look at this a little different way. I need to make the most of opportunity. And when I start to make the most of opportunity, I'm going to live a life of genuine goodness, of uncommon goodness. The next thing he says is uncommon speech. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. Now, we've talked a lot about what it means to speak with grace and truth, so I'm not going to rehash that. If you're interested, you can write on your communication card. We'd be happy to give you a link to an to a, a online teaching about grace and truth, what it means to speak with grace and truth, or get you a, a CD or a DVD. We'd be happy to do that. I'm not going to do that. But the, the scriptures say... Uh, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. If you're seasoning it with salt, do you need a little or a lot? Audience, re audience response at this point, little or a lot? Little? Nobody wants to admit like I do, I want a lot. Yeah, I saw one hand kind of go, I'm an a lot person too. I want a lot of salt on my food. My wife uh, chastises me on a regular basis because I salt my food before I taste it. Like, don't do that, that's not good for you. You see, the, the idea here is though it's to individual taste. Seasoned as it were with salt. Sometimes you put too much salt, it's like pouring salt in the wound. And it's probably not what God would have. Sometimes you've got to pour salt in the wound for healing. But a lot of times it's not. It's, it's seasoned to, to individual taste. And so you understand, you're tracking with me, right? Uncommon speech. Somebody, somebody just lays you out and says, and you respond with grace. Well, you should have, you should have just, just told them off. No, that's not what God would have me to do. Uncommon goodness, uncommon speech, and it leads to an uncommon response. Check out what your Bible says. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how to, what's the next word in your Bible? Answer every man. When do you give an answer? Not a trick question. When do you give an answer? When you're asked a question. What? Pe people are going to ask me a question? When people see uncommon goodness and uncommon speech in you, I guarantee you the door opens up and they're going to ask you all kinds of questions and be ready to give an answer. Be ready to give an answer. When they ask you the question, they see your uncommon speech, they, he uh, they hear your uncommon speech, they see your uncommon goodness, and they're going to ask you a question. Some of you get petrified at this point. 
I don't know what I'd say about Jesus. If somebody asked me, I, I don't know how I'd tell my story. I don't know I'd, how I'd carry on the conversation. I want to point you to a resource. There's this amazing book that I think is going to pop up here on the screen, I think. There's this amazing book. I don't know if you've read it. It's called The Best Kept Secret of the Christian Mission. If, I, I wish I could give every one of you a copy. If you've never read this book, buy the book. I, I, I bought a copy a year ago on Amazon for a dollar. You can find it. It was, it was just released last year. It's, this is an amazing book. And this amazing book, as he talks about what it means to share the gospel, he gives three, he gives three points for, for uncommon response. First was be brief. Don't feel like you've got to answer everybody, every question in that conversation. When somebody asks you, hey, you know what they're going to ask you? They see uncommon goodness and uncommon speech. Who are you? I don't see anybody live like that. I don't hear anybody talk like that. I don't hear anybody offer grace and forgiveness. Who are you? Be brief. Always pull in or bring in a Jesus story. Is a second tip. And then his third tip is end with a question. End with a question. Make them want more. Be brief. Always pull in a Jesus story and end with a question. So go like this. Hey, Tim, I just saw that person treat you in a really, really poor way. And you are so gracious. Who are you that you would do that? Well, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, I could never be a follower of Jesus. How come? I've been to church before, and churches are filled with hypocrites. You ever hear that? Church is filled with hypocrites. What do I say when somebody says church is filled with hypocrites? Be brief. Bring in a Jesus story. And end with a question. You know what? I've seen it too. I've seen people who pretend to be one thing on Sunday morning and something else on Monday through Saturday. I, I've seen it too. You know what? There's this one time Jesus was eating at the house of a notorious sinner. And the religious people got so upset. They got so upset and they even asked, why, why, why do you eat with people like him? You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, because it's the kind of people who need me to eat with them. They're sick and they need a doctor and I, I can make them well. They need mercy and I offer that. And, and those righteous people, they, they don't need me. By the way, how long has it been since you've read any of the Jesus story? Be brief, bring in a Jesus story. End with a question. Hey Tim, that that person, maybe you've heard this, that person just um, laid you out and they're, they're judging how you live and uh, they, they shouldn't judge how you live. How, how come you're treating them like, because I'm a Jesus follower. Well, all Jesus followers are judgmental. I've never seen anybody who's not judgmental. I can't go to church because because Jesus followers are so judgmental. Hey, you know what? I've seen it too. You just saw somebody judging my life and, and I get that. You know, there's this one time that Jesus was over at this guy's house eating and this lady, who was a prostitute, came up behind him and started crying and her tears fell to his feet and she let her hair down and she dried his feet with her hair. And the religious people in the room said, if he knew what kind of woman she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. They were being judgmental of this woman. And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said to those religious people, this lady's closer to God than you are. Hey, how long has it been since you read any of the Jesus story? Be brief, bring in a Jesus story. You know, there's this one time when Jesus' best friend in the world died. He showed up at the funeral. He didn't show up at the funeral. He was late and he got to the tomb and he wept. And, and, and his sisters let Jesus have it. When they saw Jesus, they told him, How dare you not show up? I thought you loved my brother. Where were you? If you would have been here, you could have done something, Brett. It's okay to let God have it. By the way, I know you're not going to church, but when's the last time you even read some of the Jesus story? Be brief, pull in a Jesus story, and end with a question. Some of you are like, Tim, that's so easy for you. You're the preacher. You know, you know the Bible better than I do. Buy the book. The first appendix is worth the price that you pay. The first appendix of this book gives eight common objections to Christianity, a Jesus story that goes with every objection, and helps you understand how to talk to people. Buy the book. But better than buying the book... Learn the book. Learn the book. Not that book, but that book. The book that tells you this story, that in the beginning God said, and it was so, and it was good. And human beings said, God, we don't believe you're God, we don't believe you're good, and we will not trust you. And mankind has been on a 
race away from God ever since. But God has pursued even faster to the point when he sent his son Jesus. And that God desperately wants to have a relationship with you. That book will help. That book will change your life. I'm praying for you because you're a preacher. I'm praying that God would open the doors that you want opened. And as people come flooding through, you'll make the way plain. I'm praying for you that you will live an uncommon life. And when you live a life of uncommon goodness and un- you, you speech, uh, uncommon speech, people are going to ask questions. Who are you? I'm just a follower of Jesus and he loves me. Here's what I know. Almighty God, I come in front of you this day thankful for a room full of preachers. Who by coming to this table and taking this bread and dipping it in this cup said, yes, I will proclaim the message of Jesus. I believe that he was the son of God. I confess with my mouth that he is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. God, in the lives of my preacher friends, open doors that only you can open. God, I pray you'd open doors in their family. I pray you'd open doors at their workplace. I pray you'd open doors in our city. That this entire city would be found for Jesus. God, I pray that you teach us how to live uncommon lives. Uncommon goodness. Looking for the best in the place and in the people. Not seeing the negative, but seeing that you're blessing us right now. And that with every opportunity, we not consider it a waste, but we consider it just that, an opportunity. God, change our hearts however you need to change them. And God, when people ask, and they're going to ask, may we know the story so well that we don't blow it. Father, for friends like my friend Brett, maybe in this room today that are hurting, (laughs) and in their eyes you have a lot of explaining to do, God, open the door of their heart. Help them to say to you whatever they need to say to you. And may they be prepared for the answer of love that you want to give. God, this week, may we live uncommon lives. And may we not blow our chances with the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, My mother harassed me all week long when we were back in Missouri. Why are you going back on Sunday? Why are you going back on Sunday? Why are you going back on Sunday? She asked me once. She asked me 350 times. I don't know. She just, and I drove 650 miles yesterday because I believe this is one of the most important messages at this time in the life of our community of faith that needed to be spoken. And it's time. It's time we live like priests. It's time we live like prophets. It's time we live uncommon lives. And it's time that the city is one for Jesus. And so I hope that you'll just join me in that prayer again. If you'll join me in that prayer that God would open the spiritual door of this city, would you write that on a connection card? It would, it would make my day if you just put it in the joy basket before you leave. If you want to come at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights, we meet right here in this room to pray. I won't be here tonight because I'm turning around and heading 650 miles back to Missouri uh, with a group of 10 that are, that are leaving to go out and join the group of 26 that's already there as we start work at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Along those lines, I, I need to ask you to begin to pray uh, specifically for the group that's in Joplin. Uh, the, the group that's out there now will be taking a tour of the city and probably in about two hours, and, the, and they're going to be exposed to some things that they've never seen. This was a real tragedy with real people in a real place, and it's going to be incredibly emotional, and we're not doing it for the emotion of it, but I think it's important for two, two parts. One, so many of the people in Joplin just desperately need to tell their story. It's desperate, it's therapeutic for them to get a chance to tell an audience their story. And so it's going to, we're going to be able to offer them that opportunity. But it will be amazing for our, our folks as well. Parents, if you have students that are there and I share that story and you're like, oh, I wish I could be there, what's going on? I want you to rest assured that all of the adults on the trip are going to be extra sensitive all week long to your children, to your students. Uh, we've already talked with the adults that are there, and we'll all talk with the adults that are, that are going this afternoon. Um, if there's a student struggling, it's more important that we deal with that student in that moment than continue to work. 
We're going to be extra sensitive to the students that are around us. And uh, we understand that you have given us a great privilege of taking your students with us. And we do not take that lightly. Uh, they are our ultimate concern, their safety, and not just their physical safety, but their spiritual safety and their spiritual well-being. But that said, I need those of you that are here to be praying for us, uh, that we would be sensitive to the needs of the students and that those opportunities that present themselves, not, not just would be emotional, but they would be life-changing, that God would really speak into the hearts of the adults and the students that are there, all right? So if you'd do that with me, that'd, that'd be great. Uh, we're going to be out there through Friday. We'll travel back Saturday, and uh, Lord willing, we'll get the chance to see you in this place again next Sunday. So would you stand with me for a word of uh, blessing and benediction? If you made a decision to follow Jesus today, if you're wanting to be baptized, it uh, looks like we're going to have a baptismal service the last Sunday this month on the 31st. If you're wanting to be baptized, we'd love to talk to you about that. We'll be down front. The pastoral staff would be happy to talk to you. And now, my brothers and sisters, and to all the preachers in this room, I pray for you that God would open the doors that you want opened, doors into your family, doors into your neighborhood, doors into your workplaces, doors into your schools, doors into your city. And I pray that when people come running through, they would see uncommon goodness and hear uncommon speech and that you would make plain the way of Jesus. And that when they ask, who are you? You'll simply say, a follower of Jesus and you'll tell them the story and until we meet again my brothers and sisters may the favor and the blessing of our Lord rest on you and may his peace surround you peace be with you